Hi everyone, my name is Tom Maurice, so I'm research manager at Fabian Novel, a global innovation uh, consultancy focused on the digital transformation of their organizations. Uh, before diving into uh, the conversation with our three guests, I'd like to say just a few words of introduction and first of what we mean by artificial intelligence, uh, which could easily take the whole panel in itself. Uh, so what we mean by artificial intelligence is uh, the creation of programs that try to emulate the way humans act or think. Uh, so there have been two main uh, approaches uh, in the field of AI in the last uh, 60 years of its history. So the first one was called symbolic programming and consisted in creating rigid rules to create the program. So the, the problem was that it was time consuming and uh, it could not easily be extended to new problem sets. And the second approach in AI that is behind the uh, resurgence of AI in the last few years is called machine learning and uh, leverages huge data sets and important computing resources to let the algorithms find correlations among the data themselves. And uh, there have been numerous uh, applications uh, generated by AI. We'll talk about it uh, in more depth, but we can quote uh, AlphaGo, that was mentioned earlier. It was a real breakthrough because it was a, it's a really complex game uh, to, com to master for a machine. Uh, we can talk about uh, smart voice assistants, of which uh, Amazon Echo speaker and its Alexa software is uh, probably the pioneer. And uh, last one would be autonomous vehicles, all type of uh, autonomous vehicles, including, of course, self-driving cars. Uh, and in this AI landscape, uh, China has been uh, not only catching up, it would be a little bit unfair to say that, but is now leading. Uh, for a few years now, China has been the major publisher of uh, scientific papers linked to AI. And in 2017, according to CB Insights, China was the uh, number one country for investment in uh, AI startups in volume. Uh, and it's a national priority indeed, because uh, you've probably heard that last year, the Chinese State Council drafted uh, a national plan that aims at making artificial intelligence a uh, uh, $150 billion industry by 2030. There have been a lot of announcements of scientific parks being in development. Uh, the government has enlisted the help of uh, Chinese tech uh, companies. For instance, uh, Te Tencent is responsible for uh, the part of the plan related to healthcare. Uh, Baidu is in charge of autonomous cars. Uh, and those large tech companies are increasingly investing outside of China, creating research centers in, in California, for instance. And what's even more interesting is that it seems like the whole Chinese population is interested in the development of AI. Maybe you read last week uh, a survey that was created by uh, um, Tencent and CCTV. Uh, and the respondents, the Chinese respondents to the survey, 80% uh, of them uh, thought that AI was going to affect every industry and 90% of them were eager to learn more about AI if given the opportunity. So I think that uh, the question is not whether AI generates new opportunities, but rather uh, which are the most significant ones and how you can join in the action. So to offer a few answers to these burning questions, we. We're lucky to have three experts with us today. Uh, Xavier Bayard is incubator director at Valeo, a major French uh, automotive supplier with more than 18 billion euros of sales in 2017. He's based in Paris. Benjamin Joff is partner at Hacks, uh, the world's leading uh, investor, early stage investor in hardware startups. He's based in Paris and Shenzhen. And lastly, Nicolas Ducré is partner at Cate Innovation. Uh, cross-border 300 million euros VC fund that invests in China, in Europe, and in North America. He's based in Shanghai. So first question, uh, simple but really important, what are the main applications of AI you've seen in China? Nicola, do you want to start? Well, um, I would say all, all the industries will be disrupted by AI in China, so actually it can be quite broad. Uh, but um, I think the, the, um, the two main applications that we've seen actually with uh, having a commercial impact and actually commercial applications uh, already for quite a, quite a, quite a, quite a long time is uh, one of them is actually facial recognition, 
um, two companies that were actually uh, named earlier, like SenseTime, Face++, and so on, having uh, achieved very, very high level of, uh, of uh, accuracy. Uh, actually, the algorithm can, uh, can, uh, can be better than human. So, um, and this is used in particular for some of the uh, apps, like payment apps, when you need to authenticate somebody. Uh, so they have gathered all this uh, facial data from uh, you know, ID card, database, and so on, and they're able to actually certify that uh, somebody who's paying is actually the right person uh, that matches uh, the ID information uh, linked to that specific payment. Um, so this is being used uh, you know, by banking applications, by the big payment applications, um, and there's a working business model behind this specific technology. Um, and in relation to that, I think also something where AI has uh, actually um, uh, achieved significant uh, commercial impact is uh, also around fintech, is actually the way um, the fintech companies in China use machine learning to uh, build credit scores. Um, so it's done by Alipay, uh, but it's also done by a number of companies like uh, WeCash, for example, or Pintech, this kind of companies that can um, gather um, data from users when they need to get some kind of installment or facility for payment, to buy a mobile phone, to buy a computer, and so on. Um, they can provide like small loans, um, but the qualification of, uh, of the, the buyer, the consumer, is based on the data that is gathered from a past uh, purchasing behavior, um, what kind of uh, phone you own, um, things like what you've bought, uh, what you've, uh, I mean, the way you use your mobile, what kind of application you use. Um, sometimes it goes all the way to trying to find out who your friends are. Um, and this data actually is used to qualify people um, and, and, and determine whether or not they, they can qualify for, for the loan. Um, and so this is very quick, can be done at the point of sale, um, and, and then right away they can get a, basically the 10,000 quads they need to buy a computer. Uh, this is AI powered and very, very successful today. Thank you very much. Xavier, do you want to add something? So maybe I will just give a little bit of context because uh, I'm uh, industry focused and less uh, the other uh, uh, speakers. Um, Today, uh, the automotive industry is being completely transformed by uh, three uh, revolutions that are happening simultaneously. Um, and, uh, and Valeo is really at the heart of these three revolutions. The first one is the electrification revolution. So, so you might see that there are lots of cities around the world that are now declaring that they want to be uh, CO2 free. or So they want to ban diesel engines or uh, they want to have uh, full electric vehicles only uh, circulating in, uh, in the inner parts of the, of the cities. And uh, we are providing uh, systems and solutions to uh, bring more electrification in the powertrain. So we're building hybrid systems, we're building uh, systems for full electric vehicles, for example. The second uh, revolution is about uh, the autonomous driving. So uh, historically, uh, Valeo has a, has a strong business around sensors, all the sensors, cameras, lidars, radars, ultrasonic, that are uh, needed, that are the eyes of the future autonomous car, we are providing them. And, uh, and we're also working on uh, highly aut high automation uh, solutions for, for, for example, uh, auto automated parking. And the third revolution is what we call digital mobility. Uh, this is the, the idea that the, the digital economy is also entering the, 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 autonomous bu uh, the um, automotive business uh, and is focused on the usages. So we are shifting from an ownership model where everyone wants to own a car to a usage-based model where Basically, when you need the car, you want to have it, and when you don't need, you don't want the trouble. Uh, and this is uh, typically all these uh, new uh, new models around uh, car sharing, car ride hailing, and, and, and so on and so forth. So in all the three uh, revolutions, what you can see is that well, China is a, a very big player, of course. Uh, to, sit on, to cite only a few examples, uh, if we talk about electrification, you can think about NIO, for example, on autonomous driving. Baidu is very active, but there are also startups like Momenta working on the topic. And on the digital mobility, DD is an obvious choice, but there, are so, 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 so much, there is so much more. So for this reason, uh, Valeo is focusing very much on China on all these topics. Uh, China is already uh, today our biggest country in terms of uh, sales, 17% of the global sales. It's also our largest workforce with uh, more than 18,000 people. And we believe that uh, solutions uh, for uh, the Chinese market must be developed and must be found uh, in China. And where does uh, AI come in all of this? 
well, it's maybe not obvious on the electrification part, part but whether it's autonomous driving or a digital mobility, you can think of numerous examples where AI will be a must. Uh, autonomous driving, if you want to reach high levels of automations, you, you will need to have uh, uh, artificial intelligence. You cannot think about all the cases that can happen when the car is driving alone. You really need a system that is able to learn from its mistakes, uh, learn from, uh, from, from the others, and, and, be, uh, and be little by little more and more autonomous. And um, so this is one of the examples, for example, that you see a lot in China. And then another example would be uh, around uh, personalization. From the moment you don't own a car anymore, uh, what you expect from a service provider like Didi or others is that at least uh, the, the, the system is smart enough to know, to know you. And this comes by, for example, entering a car and being recognized by the system. So, okay, it's you. Uh, I know that you like this music. I know where you like to go. I know how you like to set your seat. And all these, uh, all these uh, applications can only happen if there is an artificial intelligence engine behind that is learning from uh, the way you, you're driving or you like to drive or you like to be driven and then uh, automatically sets uh, uh, the, the, the system to your, to your needs. So basically, yeah, I would say in automotive uh, industry, autonomous driving, personalization, they are the two strong trends, and of course we see them in China more than, uh, more than, more than ever. Thank you. Benjamin, what is your point of view? Um, so if it's possible to get my slide on there, I actually have a few examples. It's the last one. It was the last one. <laughs> right, it's gone. Um, okay, so... Um, so we invested in hardware startups and we have about a couple hundred companies in portfolio. And uh, some time ago we actually asked ourselves, how should we invest in AI? Because everybody's talking about it in the investment space. It, it became a really big topic probably about two years ago, uh, on some, uh, like for in some cases earlier. And then we looked at our portfolio and we realized that out of our companies, we probably had a third that had some form of AI or machine learning. Um, so in the hardware category, I would put things around robotics, uh, and generally it's not consumer robot, it's more like industry or enterprise applications. To give examples, uh, we have one company that's uh, uh, doing inventories in supermarket. So the robot just goes around the supermarket and using computer vision, image recognition, it can actually analyze everything that's on the shelf in just 30 minutes instead of 30 hours. So this is one example uh, of application of AI and r realizing that actually it's, it's, it's been there for a while. Uh, from consumer standpoint, generally what we hear about is what's uh, addressed to us, which is like uh, the voice applications like Amazon. China has tons of those now. Every, of, every single one of the big software or hardware companies has some kind of a voice activated agent. Um, now th that's one application. The second is around uh, uh, face recognition, image recognition. So we heard about surveillance, we heard about uh, uh, different applications, even in beauty. In a way, uh, the company that presented earlier, Meitu, they have a huge data set of faces. That's incredible a set, a set actually to do AI. Uh, it's been applied in, uh, in China in some, uh, in some companies, uh, like in retail for instance, there's uh, today uh, a, few, um, a few chains of entirely autonomous supermarkets. You come in, they just recognize you using the camera and face recognition, and then all the payment is all digital and electronic. The only thing that's not autonomous is the way they refill the shelves. And that could become autonomous. So those are some, uh, I think, some interesting developments. And uh, on, from our point of view, the most interesting is really on the enterprise um, applications and also on the health applications. So in health, that means collecting a lot of data from people to help them either prevent or predict some conditions that might arise. And then the next step is really providing them a feedback loop so they can correct their behavior or you can actually do something to, uh, to make them healthier or, or even potentially like more, more than healthy. So those are some very interesting developments. Uh, the, we invest mostly in foreign startups and they work with the Shenzhen ecosystem because Shenzhen is the, the world capital for electronics. Um, and thanks to Shenzhen, they're able to create products much faster, much cheaper, and sell internationally. Uh, one recent company uh, we invested in in uh, Sweden called Flow Neuroscience is a, basically a kind of a headset uh, that can uh, not only track your brain activity, but also using um, a brain stimulation to help fight depression. So you can see devices with machine learning and new sensors now able to actually compete 
with better solutions with pharmaceutical companies. So those are just some examples. Interesting. Um, in your opinion, why has the Chinese AI ecosystem advanced so fast in the last few years? Benjamin, can keep Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think there's a few elements there. Uh, first, the, the market is very large. Uh, the access to data sets is also much easier than in other markets uh, because of this size. Uh, so Chinese companies are able to scale very fast. Uh, the speed of the market, uh, the ability to scale fast, means that you can create a lot of value for an AI company. Uh, in addition, there's now a lot of talent being trained in China, some of it by local trainers, some of it coming back from overseas. Uh, I think one of the famous examples would be Andrew Ng, uh, a Chinese-American. Uh, and he studied in the US and then came to be the chief scientist at Baidu. And then worked on a bunch of other projects with Google and uh, now he's doing his own AI stuff. So, uh, and actually, interestingly, one, one of his new projects is an AI company uh, that helps factories improve their processes by monitoring and doing predictive maintenance and optimizing processes in factories. Okay. Uh, Nicola, what is your point of view of an uh, investor also? Well, the fact is actually the AI sector in China is, um, uh, is subject to very strong government involvement. Um, it's, there is a government push at the highest level actually to uh, support the development of indigenous technology in artificial intelligence and to create national champions that could potentially sell the technology outside of China down the road. Um, which means, uh, and, and also I would add, because some of the AI application can have some state-related, uh, let's say, uh, functions, you know, we're talking about surveillance, for example, uh, and facial recognition can be a component of that. Uh, it means that usually the government uh, comes close to AI companies at a point in, in the, 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 the stages of development. We've seen that in, a, in the facial recognition companies where they both raise a big chunk of money and both, in both times it was actually a government fund. Uh, that, I that think that the, they have the highest valuation among AI companies all over the world, this specific... Uh, yes, uh, because it's, it's, uh, it's also um, it's, it's, uh, preparing the future of China that to uh, support the development of artificial intelligence. Uh, and the main reason is actually it will help China uh, improve the way it, it operates, the, the, make the, the industries more productive, uh, the, the factories more efficient, uh, and also to facilitate daily life thanks to digital services. Um, for that reason, actually, uh, we, we can expect a lot of things happening in that specific space in China. But again, um, it's definitely in accordance of the government's plan. Okay. Um, now the question is, how can European companies leverage uh, China momentum in AI? Uh, maybe Xavier, you want to, to talk about your experience uh, at Valeo, how you tap the, the Chinese movement in artificial intelligence? Sure. Well, f first point, uh, we are uh, at Valeo uh, already a limited partner in the Cathay Innovation Fund. So uh, we, we, are, we are working with Nicola on a, on, on a daily basis. And, uh, and because it was, uh, we, we thought it was not enough, uh, what we wanted was we, the, the first we, we, we can see that, uh, the, the, for example, the Chinese ecosystem of startups is moving very fast. And there are lots of opportunities that are very, very local also. You, you, sometimes you cannot see the same stuff uh, in, in other places. Uh, and because of this, uh, this um, because of what we see, uh, we've decided that we want to do more uh, with uh, startups in China. And that's why we ask uh, the people from Cathay to uh, work with us on creating a new fund, uh, a fund that is dedicated to automotive technologies that will only, that is only, because it started already to invest, is only investing in uh, Chinese startups uh, and, uh, and for that, because we believe that it's also important to be part of the ecosystem, uh, we are looking uh, for uh, partners as other limited partners uh, in, the, in the Chinese uh, industrial world. So we are now uh, partnering with, uh, with um, the, the, uh, a local fund from the, the province, uh, province of Hubei and, uh, and uh, leveraging also all the automat Chinese automotive ecosystem to create this fund that will uh, invest in uh, several uh, startups in AI for sure and also in other technologies. And um, th this, is a, this is one example, for example, of how we think we can uh, leverage the, the unique position of China. Uh, another uh, initiative that we have that is uh, starting in France but will be global is uh, what we call Valeo.ai. We created, we announced last year the creation of uh, so Valeo.ai, which is a, a research center for artificial intelligence uh, based for now in Paris. 
the goal of this uh, center is to lead two types of activities. First, uh, research activities in AI, and for that we are working in connection with a network of uh, uh, high-level universities and research centers in the area. And the director of Valeo.ai is one of, uh, is a researcher. These people working on uh, the next solutions in AI for automotive industry and publishing freely. This is absolutely not a, a closed environment. It's really a research environment. And then the second activity led by uh, Valeo engineers, which is uh, to uh, develop solutions, uh, new new services and new products for the automotive industry based on the research. And we are starting with a few uh, universities in France for now, but we know that this has to be a global, uh, a global project. There are uh, talents in AI everywhere in the world, in particular in Chinese, due to the size of the country. We are already uh, cooperating with Chinese universities. For example, uh, we are working on an innovation chair with Chao Tong University in Shanghai on the autonomous vehicle. And our goal is to, uh, little by little, grow this network of, uh, of AI talents and, uh, and, uh, and cover the whole, uh, the whole Chinese ecosystem. Nicolas, do you have uh, additional examples of cross-border innovation in uh, AI in China? So if we're thinking about, uh, let's say, European artificial intelligence companies coming into China, I think it, 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 it would be quite challenging. Uh, the main reason being actually the, the quality of the algorithm depends on the quality of the training data you use. So if you want to be able to serve a Chinese market, you need actually Chinese data, uh, whether it's facial recognition, whether it's driving data, all these kind of things. And then if you're a foreign company and you want to get access to Chinese data, it's extremely challenging. Um, but I'd like to give a counter example. Um, <laughs> we actually invested in a French company called Okin um, that does artificial intelligence uh, for two things. Uh, first is to improve actually the detection of cancer um, using in particularly um, uh, like deep learning to identify uh, uh, cancer inside the imagery, uh, you know, like either radio or AMR, AMR and so on. And the other aspect is to actually um, to, 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 to identify lookalikes uh, in terms of patients. So when you have a patient for whom a specific cancer treatment worked well, and you have a patient that AI can determine to be similar, you can actually try to use the same treatment. Um, and they use a very smart way, actually, to, because they use actually patient data, as you can imagine, and they work with hospitals. And they use a very smart way to, um, to, to, to handle this, this data. They, they, they use a technique called uh, transfer learning, which allows basically uh, only um, let's say, pre-processed data to come out of the hospital. So the hospital and the patient's data is completely safe. Um, the advantage of this technique is actually you can also deploy it in China in the same way because you can also say to the Chinese hospital or Chinese government, Ministry of Health and so on, that you are able to protect patient's data from China. But you can add uh, uh, this specific knowledge from, from, from all over the world. And, and you know, if you, if you think about cancer, uh, probably they look the same with for Westerners and Chinese, right? So, so you can actually leverage the, the whole wealth of data from, let's say, the whole of Europe to support, uh, basically, uh, cancer treatment in China as well. So we, it's a very young company right now, so we haven't really concretized this, this, this potentiality of coming to China, but it's something we, we're considering very seriously. Thank you. Marema, if you want to add something? Yeah, I think it's uh, overall quite challenging for French companies in AI in the AI space. Not not because we don't have the talent, but because, uh, as uh, Nicolas said, the access to the data sets um, so is challenging because of um, you actually need access to a lot of users to get good data, and to do that, you generally need a lot of funding. And in France, it's not so easy to get funding because if you're only uh, looking at the French market and you're not sure how to access. China or the US, uh, it's very difficult to motivate investors to, to sign, sign you a large check. Um, so if you take essentially the same type of talent building a company in US, in China, in France, you can quickly imagine what would happen two years in, who would have the most funding, who would have the most data. Um, now the markets themselves are fairly isolated in terms of uh, application, so that, that it's, it's both uh, like a blessing and a curse. Uh, but uh, uh, the way we look at it is that it's really about trying to find the, the best resources. When you're an entrepreneur, trying to find the best resources wherever they are. So if the R&D is great in France, do the R&D in France. And then if you need uh, maybe to, so in our case, to build hardware products, you would do that in China. And then in terms of um, 
application market, the customer's market, or the funding market. Uh, you could get your funding actually from Chinese investors. There's a lot of Chinese investors now very motivated to invest outside China. Because China has become so competitive for investors that they find the deals are very expensive. And they look at European companies, they're like, oh, this is great technology, and it's cheap. And then they look at your company and they actually see more value than you because they also think that your company might have technology applicable in China and they have some ideas how to do that, whereas maybe you wouldn't be able to do that on your own. So that's also an advantage that cross-border investors like uh, Cathay and to some extent Hacks with our specialty uh, can, can help with. Great. And uh, um, since you're all investors in a sense, uh, what would be the criteria you look at when assessing a, a potential partnership or investment in, a, in an AI startup? Nicolas, if you want to, to start? Well, we will, we will certainly start with the, the talents in the company, as that's obvious. Um, but now we have a, a larger number of very good talents, you know, and some of the actually big US companies have generated good talents in China. Uh, you know, Google is launching its, uh, its AI lab, actually. Um, Microsoft has been doing AI, uh, Microsoft Research Asia has been doing AI for a long time, so they actually uh, uh, generated a lot of talents in that space. Um, on the top of that, I mean, you need to be able to, again, data is critical, so you need to be able to, to, to source quality and quantity of data in a cheap way or not too expensive way. And, uh, and, and if you have some kind of secret on how to do that, that could be also a very good, very good uh, barrier to entry. Um, and in the end, uh, we investors and uh, we're looking to, 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 to invest in technologies that can have a commercial application. So we need to find a viable uh, the business model for the technology, um, and we need to find ways actually to to to, to sell it. To I mean, especially when it's B two B, with some some specific uh, you know market needs uh, that this technology can answer. Customer needs and not only good technical solution. Yes, but yeah, I mean we use the same criteria as many other VCs. We look at the team, we look at the market, we look at uh, uh, the the technology, the um, the defensibility of technology. But I think. Some other criteria we try to assess, uh, particularly for founding teams, because we invest very early when they only have a prototype that like three people out of a lab, uh, out of a, a corporate or university. Um, what we try to assess are, are two uh, other criteria, which is grit, like how persistent are they? And the fact that they decide to work with us and come to work with us in Shenzhen is probably a good test for that already. And second is resourcefulness. Because um, essentially, as a startup founder, you, you start you don't have everything you need. You know that you don't have time, you don't have cash, you don't have the people, you just, just need to find all those things. You don't have the customers, you don't have the partners. So the, the resourcefulness is also a very important criteria for us. And the fact that they actually, again, talk to us and think that Shenzhen and China matters um, is a good sign. Now, in terms of, uh, of particular categories, uh, I saw that the slide was up, so I, if it's possible to put it, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give put some, it uh, some highlights there. Um, so here are some examples of products that we invested in that have some form of AI. The one on the left, the con uh, so on your left, yeah, same as my left. Um, the consumer one is actually a device that listens to everything a child says, um, especially in the early years of development, to help acquire language faster. And it can uh, in, uh, engage in short conversations on the increased vocabulary of children. So it's really important before the age of five. And this is like basically neuroscience uh, with feedback loops. Uh, the second one uh, is a health tech product. Third one uh, is for predictive maintenance uh, with machine learning uh, for air conditioning. And the fourth one is a robot. And uh, when we think of robot, very often we think of like humanoid robots. But this one is for automotives. It's actually to automate um, the test, uh, basically the in inspection of, of uh, truck wheels. So, and this is also really important because those type of applications that are more kind of enterprise applications uh, are easier to sell, especially when it involves very high tech uh, with devices. Uh, the price is very often not acceptable initially for customers and have to be integrated into our enterprise solutions. So those are kind of examples of things we do. And uh, as you can see, some of it looks really simple and it's all about software and some of it looks very complicated. Um, because it looks bigger, but uh, very often it's actually also about software. And Xavier, from Valio's specific standpoint, what, what are you looking at in a, in a startup? 
So, so uh, Valeo, we're not a venture capital uh, fund. We are only investing as a strategic investor, which means that the return on investment, for example, is not at all our priority. Um, what we're, when we invest in a startup, we're investing for the long term. And uh, what we are really trying to, to find out when we invest is how does the, the technology that is developed by the company translate into an automotive product or an automotive uh, service in, a, in the mi middle term, let's say. Um, so uh, for this reason, I think uh, technology is a very important part, of course. Uh, and, 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 and in AI, more than in any other, uh, in any other uh, area, uh, the team and the talents is, uh, is primordial. Uh, the, the war for talents in that area is very strong, it's very fierce, uh, and uh, Valeo uh, is competing with, uh, with the Googles and likes, but also with startups, because startups can offer the same kind of, uh, of uh, interesting uh, topics than, uh, than, uh, than uh, large corporates. So we're really competing with a large uh, panel of, uh, of companies, and, uh, and we really, really have to, to find the best way to attract these talents. So uh, investing in AI startups is also a way to, uh, to be closer to these talents. Time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.